Welcome back to Morbidly Bewitched. I have a creepy tale to add on to a trilogy that I have going at the minute. The first um, video was about the Franklin Expedition itself, heading out. And in this episode, I bring you the three bodies on Beachy Island. Stay tuned. <laughs> Nobody survived the doomed tragedy that was the Franklin Expedition, a voyage in 1845 to find the elusive Northwest Passage. A labyrinth of misfortune befell these men and their captains before sealing their fate in the fog of time and creepy legend. It would take till the 20th century before technology would advance enough to look into something left behind, dead bodies. Whenever the trip was in its infancy, they lost three of their crew and buried them on Beachy Island whenever they would have the rest of the team been in relatively good spirits and decent health. These three young guys um, died in 1846. Across this windswept plain lies four markers lovingly carved from wood and engraved in remembrance of three young men who lost their battle with many ailments during the trek. John Torrington, who was only 20, William Brain, who was 32, and John Hartnell, 25. These grave markers were noted in one of the rescue missions that was sent out for the Franklin Expedition in 1850. And the fourth grave marker is actually one of these researchers, um, Thomas Morgan, who was only 34 whenever he died and they buried him in the same line of these three men. But it wouldn't be until 1986, 136 years later, that a team of scientists that specialised in anthropology from the University of Alberta set sail to find out just what lay beneath those wind-chilled slabs. What they uncovered would far surpass what they could ever possibly imagine as they came face to face with three of the crew from the Franklin Expedition that had barely changed a day. One of the photographers from the team was a Brian Spensley and he was the great, great nephew of Hartnell, one of the bodies that was buried there. And he would never forget coming face to face with his great, great uncle, who was one of the crew members on that doomed voyage. They began first by exhuming each grave individually. When they did that, they placed a tent over the surrounding area and they started painstakingly chipping away at the first the shingle layer along the top and then down into the permafrost. This is solid, solid mass. Um, they had to go at it with chisels and spades. They couldn't just attack it with machinery because they knew that there was an extremely valuable treasure lying beneath that they did not want to risk a damaging even slightly. They also brought a husky dog along with them just to keep an eye for polar bears. They were approximately five feet into the permafrost whenever they caught a glimpse of the top of the first coffin. They chipped away around this structure being very careful and when they lifted the coffin out and it was a, a beautifully handcrafted wooden coffin by the men, they removed the lid and they were faced with a further solid block of ice within the coffin and an eerie face peering out through the frosted water at them. So to get this solid block of ice out from around the man, they started using bucket after bucket of warm water to melt it away from him so that they wouldn't cause any damage. The young man looking up at them was John Torrington. He gazed at these researchers through still preserved milky blue eyes. The Arctic conditions upon the young man's demise had acted along with the permafrost as a giant supercharged 
freezer, which meant no decomposition had occurred apart from the external damage done by the water. This young man was quite literally frozen in time. He was highly recognizable in every sense of the word, right down to his clothing. They removed him from his vessel and got to work straight away to do a post-mortem examination, uh, only to realize that he had already been subjected to one back in 1846. This was a procedure that would have been highly frowned upon by the men. You have to think as well on board these ships, there was an awful lot of superstition and they did believe that they wanted their bodies kept intact to be accepted into heaven. But it was a necessary evil that was commanded by captains upon their doctors to carry out on board the ships to foretell any signs of the dreaded scurvy, which was feared more than sinking. Clothing on the men were noted as a grey cotton shirt with shells for buttons and linen trousers with the other two men wearing very similar sets of clothing themselves. Their wrists had been bound together by strips of linen so that they didn't fall apart and a thin sheet of cloth was placed over their face before they were laid into their coffins on a bed of wood chip and the lids sealed for eternal darkness. They also appeared to have been clean shaven and they all um, had thick heads of dark hair which had started to come off the scalp but it was still very well intact. The autopsies carried out would then reveal invaluable information that would give a glimpse of the fate that befell these poor people and the doomed expedition. They uncovered botulism. This is a rare disease, um, but it would have been fatal back then, a bacteria that builds up in the system due to malnutrition that would have led to blurred vision, weakness of the limbs and general fatigue. Scurvy was the other ailment that was discovered. This is from a complete lack of vitamin C. The immune system starts to break down and you begin to bleed from your gums, your um, nosebleeds, your pores, the very pores in around your hairline will start to bleed and then you will slowly lose things like your fingernails and your teeth. The Franklin expedition thought they had this covered by taking with them a provision of gallons upon gallons of lemon juice, an antiscorbutic. This was doled out in small um, shots of lemon juice to the men every single morning to ward off scurvy. But unknown to them, lemon juice loses its potency, eventually becoming useless. The last ailment that was detected was extremely high levels of lead. This is believed to have been by one of their most advanced uh, provisions, their tinned food. The tinned food, the tin lids themselves, would have been soldered using lead and it is believed that this lead soldering sat in storage, slowly leaking into the food. The men were then consuming the food and succumb to lead poisoning. Their tinned food provision would have been the Trojan horse amongst the crew. Um, lead poisoning can lead to an array of horrible side effects like depression, confusion, cognitive delays, um, paranoia, vomiting, stomach pain, weakness in the limbs, to name but a few. It's also believed that this was the main perpetrator for signs that these men went mad. It's only from the evidence obtained from these three young men that have been able to allow scientists to put together a crude timeline of events and what possibly occurred to them after they abandoned their ships. Um, these men more than likely once they realized that they were coming, becoming quite ill after constantly consuming these tinned foods that even though they couldn't understand it there was something wrong with their provisions which was making them quite unwell meaning that everything that they had stored behind that would, would take them into another year or two was useless because either they 
ate the food and went mad, or they didn't eat the food and they starved. The decision to abandon the ships um, in 1848 would have been a torturous idea for all of the men because that was their homes and they knew they were heading out into the abyss and the unknown, the dark, solid wastelands of ice. Um, the areas that they found people, um, I'm just gonna get my wee display here, would have been here. This is where the remnants of bodies were found. All along the age line of King William Island were the signs of something drastic went wrong. The Inuits came across bodies, body parts, um, makeshift campsites that had kind of fell apart as well. So it was all along these areas. After the scientists finished their research, all of the men were respectfully laid to rest back in their frozen graves to forever remain an eerie part of the barren landscape of Beachy Island. So it's only going to be right to conclude this trilogy with a third video, or it wouldn't be a trilogy, and discuss the boats themselves, the feats of engineering, the two ladies, Erebus and Terror, to conclude this eerie historical timeline. I will see you soon.